Welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, we're going to turn our attention back to mergers and acquisitions and M&A deals and merger models because we haven't done a video on this topic in a while. I saw that we have fewer videos on this topic than some of the others. So I wanted to go through a quick question and show you an important concept on this topic and specifically cover share price dynamics in an M&A deal. So here's the question that came in the other day. Can you please explain to me quick and dirty how the share prices of two public companies normally change when an M&A deal takes place? Basically, how can I tell which share price will go up and which one will go down? So when one public company makes an offer to acquire another public company, how can you tell what direction both share prices are going to move in? The first thing I'll say about this question is that you should be very careful because Investopedia has completely the wrong answer or partially incorrect answer because they say that there is usually a predictable short term effect on the stock price of both companies. In general, the acquiring company's stock price will fall while the target company's stock price will rise. Now, this is not completely wrong, but it doesn't really tell the whole story. And the way they characterize at least part of this is incorrect, in my opinion. They're saying here that the acquiring company's stock price goes down for a number of reasons because they have to pay a premium, because there are uncertainties associated with the acquisitions, there are problems that could come up, legal, tax, other issues like that. So to tackle this question, we're going to look at the seller's share price first because that's a bit easier to explain. Then we'll look at how the buyer's share price changes and why the Investopedia article is not quite correct on this topic. So the seller's share price will almost always move closer to the offer price. In that sense, that part of the Investopedia claim is correct because the offer price has to be higher than the current share price. So if the company's current share price is $7 and you come in and offer $10 per share for it, the price is almost always going to jump up to $9.90 or $9.80 or some number that is relatively close to $10 per share. Now, it's never going to go to exactly $10 per share because there are traders betting that the M&A deal will not take place, that the acquisition will not close, that one of the companies will run into trouble for some reason, that the government will hold up the deal. Something like that might happen. And so it's never going to go exactly to $10 per share. But in general, in a case like this, yes, the seller's share price is going to go up closer to $10 from the $7 level. Now, there's no real way that the seller's share price could go down in this situation because no buyer could come in and offer less than the seller's current share price and still acquire the company. Now, you can see a pretty dramatic illustration of this with this one deal between Mitsui Sumitomo Insurance in Japan and Amlin, which is a UK-based insurer. This is Amlin's share price before the deal took place or before it was announced, and then this is their share price after it was announced. Can you guess what the offer price here was? And as with the other example, I'll give you a hint. It's not exactly 650 pence. It's not 656 pence. The deal here was actually done for a price of 670 pence per share. So you can see exactly the behavior I described. It immediately jumps up to close to the offer price, though not exactly the offer price because there's always a chance the deal could fall through. So that's the seller's share price. Now the buyer's share price is a bit trickier to explain. Because with this one, it depends on how much the market thinks the combined company is worth afterward. So let's say, for example, that the buyer has 100 shares outstanding at a share price of $10 per share. And so its equity value, therefore, is just the $10 per share times the 100 shares, so 1,000. And I'm saying these units are all in millions. I'll just keep referring to them in thousands and dollars as stated to keep it easier. Meanwhile, the seller has... 50 shares outstanding, and a share price of $5 per share. So its equity value is $250 million really, but we'll just keep going with $250. So the seller is about one-fourth the value of the buyer. And then the buyer comes in and offers the seller $7 per share for its 50 shares in an all-stock deal. So it comes in and says, you know what? You're at $5 per share right now. We're going to offer you a 40% premium and give you $7 per share, which means that it is going to pay 350 for the seller. The seller is worth 250, but the buyer comes in and pays 350 for the seller. 
So my question is, how does the buyer's share price change when it makes this offer? And the answer is it depends. And here's why. When the buyer makes an offer like this, you have to look at what the combined company's equity value is to figure out what's going on. We're assuming it's an all stock deal, which simplifies some things a bit. So we're not dealing with using cash or issuing debt or anything like that to pay for the seller. We're assuming that the buyer simply issues its shares at that share price of $10 per share in order to acquire the seller. So if you think about what happens here, the combined equity value after the buyer acquires the seller or makes an offer to do so is just going to be the buyer's current equity value plus whatever it is paying for the seller's equity. So 1,000 plus 350 here is just 1,350. Now, if you think about the number of shares that are issued in the deal, I lay out the math there in PowerPoint, but the buyer is going to issue 35 shares to do it. Why? Because it is paying $350 for the seller. The buyer's share price is worth $10 per share right now, and $350 divided by $10 per share is just 35 shares. So we can just take the equity purchase price and divide by the buyer's share price of $10 per share right there. What this means is that after the transaction closes, there are going to be 100 shares from the buyer outstanding, and then the 35 shares that were issued in the deal outstanding post-transaction. I have a note over here, but remember that in an M&A deal like this, when you acquire 100% of the seller, all of its shares go away because it no longer exists as an independent entity. So its shares all go away, and all that remains is the buyer's 100 shares plus the 35 shares that were issued in the deal. So the combined equity value is 1,350. But the relevant question now is, what does the market think the combined company is worth? Now, we don't know what the answer to this question is because we haven't valued the combined company. To really answer this, we'd have to value it with a DCF and comparable companies and other methodologies and see what it's actually worth. But to give you a few examples, if the combined company according to the market, is worth 1350 the buyer's share price is going to stay exactly the same. Why is that the case? Well, because if the market thinks the company should be worth that much, we have that value, and then we just divide by the total shares outstanding post-deal, and we get to a share price of $10 per share, which is exactly the same as what the buyer is worth right now. And so in this case, we just take this new value and we subtract what the buyer is currently worth, and its share price hasn't changed at all. But now let's say we have another scenario. Let's say that the market actually thinks the company should be worth more than this because of synergies, because of new expansion opportunities, because of new growth opportunities in some product segment. And let's say it thinks the company should be worth 1400 for the combined equity value. Well, in this case, the implied share price post deal is $10.37. And so the buyer's share price will actually increase by 37 cents right here. Why? Because when they made the deal to acquire the company, they agreed to issue 35 shares. And they did this under the assumption that each share is worth $10 and therefore the seller was worth 350. But the market came in and said, you know what? Actually, we think that you're undervaluing this company. And we think that as a combined entity, you're worth more than this. Therefore, since there are 135 shares outstanding, to reflect that value, we are going to bid up your share price and it's going to go up to $10.37 instead. So that's one scenario. But then another scenario is maybe the market thinks it's, it should not be worth this much. Maybe it thinks the combined company should only be worth $1,300 or really $1.3 billion here. And in this case, you can see what happens, the exact opposite. The post deal implied share price is only $9.63 which is less than the buyer's current share price. And so its value per share should fall. Its share price is gonna decrease by 37 cents here because those same 135 shares are outstanding, but the market sentiment has changed and now it believes the combined company is worth less. There could be many reasons for this. A legal problem could come up. Some type of doubt about the combined company to realize the stated synergies could come up. Maybe the market turns more pessimistic about one of the company's growth opportunities. It could be almost anything. So in short, it depends heavily on market sentiment and the buyer's share price could flip-flop quite a bit 
over the time between when the transaction is announced and when it closes. To show you a real life example, let's think about the Facebook and WhatsApp deal. So Facebook announced a deal to acquire WhatsApp for $19 billion in February of 2014. It closed in October of 2014. And it was mostly a stock deal. It was around 75% stock. So it's pretty close to our scenario here, which is the vast majority stock. Was it a good deal or not? And how did Facebook's share price actually change after it was announced? Well, in the short term, right when it was announced in the middle of February, Facebook's share price actually increased. But then you can see what happened afterward. It fell from around $70 per share down to below $60 per share. And all the way up until May or so, so several months after the deal was announced, Facebook's share price actually fell by a fairly substantial amount over where it was at when the deal was announced and when it initially increased after the acquisition was announced. But then if you go a little bit further out and go to the time when the deal closed at the end of October, and now the story looks a bit different because now it looks like what happened is that the share price fell initially, but then over the long term, between then and the end of the year, it actually increased by a good amount and it went up to between 70 and $80 per share by the end of October when the transaction actually closed. So this just goes to show you that it's not quite as simple as what Investopedia claims right here. Yes, in a lot of cases, the acquiring company stock price will fall, but it's not always true. And it depends on whether you're looking at the short-term impact or the long-term impact or both of those together. And to do a quick recap and summary now, we'd say that in an M&A deal, when you're looking at the seller, the seller's share price will tend to increase and approach the buyer's offer price because the buyer always has to offer more than what the seller's share price currently is. The buyer's share price depends on the combined company's equity value relative to the market's perception of what it should be worth. So if the market thinks that the company combined should be worth more than the buyer's equity value plus the equity price it's paying for the seller, the share price could increase. If it thinks it should be worth less than that, the buyer's share price could decrease. So it depends heavily on shifting sentiments and there isn't a real universal way you could characterize it other than to go back to this rule. One thing I'll leave you with as we go away here is what would happen in a 100% cash or debt deal? We looked at a 100% stock deal here, or at least a heavily stock-based deal, but how would it change if you're using cash or debt instead? I'm not gonna answer that question. It's just something for you to think about and to ponder as you think about the share price dynamics and M&A deals and how they change as buyers offer different prices for sellers in these types of transactions.